Okay, the next question is from a ranking Russian diplomat uh, who is posted here in the United States. And he says, Dr. LaRouche, I gave considerable uh, thought as to whether this should be asked publicly or privately, and after some discussion with my colleagues, I decided to ask it publicly. Uh, certainly, the inauguration of this new administration of you Americans brought a certain sense of optimism. But since your president's very first trip to Europe, specifically to London, we've experienced a series of mixed signals that we'd like your thoughts on. On the one hand, our government's work with your Secretary of State, who we like very much, holds the promise of being very productive, not only for our two nations, but for the rest of the world, particularly as our two great nations work together to foster development in areas of the world where, where it is greatly needed. But other high officials of your government express a very different and often an arrogant, if not explicitly hostile and provocative point of view. We are not new at this game, and we understand what you Americans call the carrot and stick approach. But this appears to us to be something more than that. So the question is, how do we respond? Yes, we have received assurances of an intended partnership from Mrs. Clinton, and we trust that this is honestly her approach. But our question is, is it also the view of the Oval Office? If it is not, then the question is, how much leeway does Mrs. Clinton actually have? Can she continue her work and also remain in her post? Well, you have two aspects to this government in Washington. First of all, our system of government, because we are a presidential system, is not based entirely on the, on the personality of the president or his ideas. We are, especially in our better times, we are very much a system, a presidential system, something you don't have in Europe. We may have some, some samples of it in Russia now, but you don't have it in Europe generally. Europe, you have parliamentary systems. And parliamentary systems are not very good systems. They are relics of feudalism. It's a compromise of feudalism. For example, take the German Constitution, uh, the, the Grundgesetz. And there are aspects of the Grundgesetz which are highly commendable in terms of the principle expressed in that particular article of the Constitution. But you don't have the kind of coherence of a national principle which you have in the case of the US federal constitution. Then you look at the similar thing in Europe generally. You don't have the idea of a constitution as we have it in the United States. Our constitution was, was built from the ground up. It was built up by a new nation, yes, of Europeans largely, but it was based on the European culture, but it was not based on the European oligarchical tradition. The problem in Europe is that the constitutions are based on the European oligarchical tradition, a tradition which is very close to monetarism. In our, in our case, we, instead of adopting certain precepts, formulations, like contracts. Our constitutions are not contract law. European constitutions tend to be contract law, not natural law. Our conception of law, of constitutional law, is natural law. What is the natural requirement of human beings, and what is the distinction among, among the requirements because of national cultures. But you can, the nation state is necessary because only a people which is sharing the same culture in depth, down to the child and to the poorest, as well as the richest and the best informed, only that can be the basis for a national development. Therefore, we require sovereign nation states in order to bring forth the best result from a national culture, from the participants in a national culture.
but otherwise the idea of a constitution should be common to all people. It should be a common principle such as the Westphalian principle, which has been rejected by Europe now as a result of the Tony Blair obsession, obscenity. Hmm? Tony Blair decreed from Chicago that the, the, uh, that principle is dead. And they're acting like that. We're now back to heathen nonsense. Hmm? So therefore, we, but we, at the same time, we of different nations and different constitutions, or so-called constitutions, have an underlying common interest and common principle, which is that of mankind, the distinction of mankind from the beast. We have a sense of community. We have a sense of national culture. And we protect national culture because it's that what binds us more immediately together. But we also seek a commonality of a higher constitution, which we hope is reflected in our respective constitutions our commitment to the nature of humanity, the destiny of humanity, and the participation of each nation in contributing to that common destiny of humanity. So now we are in a period where we're under the control of a certain dynamic, which is largely London. The, the government of the United States is from London right now. The President of the United States is a puppet of British interests. For example, let's take the Nazi health care law, which Obama has been desperately trying to put through. It's a, exactly the same law that we hung people for in Nuremberg for their health care policy. And retroactively, President Obama should be hung at a Nuremberg trial for what he has advocated now, since he's advocated the same crime for which we killed people in judgment at Nuremberg, shouldn't he be hung today? Hmm? I mean, that's the, moral, the morality of this thing. This guy has no right to this policy. His policy is evil. And insofar as he adheres to that policy, he is being evil. It's like the guy who's a nice guy who commits a mass murder. He may be a nice guy, but he committed a mass murder. <laughs> There's a little bit of contradiction there. <laughs> so the case here is the, the future lies not with a tendency expressed by an individual. As I was said yesterday, and I was guest at a meeting of, of the Chinese embassy on, on this occasion, the essential relationship between China and the United States or Russia and the United States, or then in turn, China and Russia, which do not otherwise always agree. But the essential agreement has to be an, in, an intention among the nation states to live together and to cooperate together. Now the question here is, all the people of the United States, despite this wretch we have as a president, despite that crowd of criminals, of Nazi-like criminals, which he has as his health care advisors, can the United States per, per, adhere still to its honor in relationship to other nations? Do the people of the United States wish to survive? Will they rise up now in the month of August and threaten to lynch those members of Congress who have shown undue sympathy for the proposed legislation and rules of President Obama. The trend is now that Obama is becoming more and more hated. There are still some people foolishly devoted to him, but the number of people who downright hate him and want him out of there is greatly increasing by the day. This guy is not popular and his policies are not going to work, the disaster is going to increase, the rate of hatred of this president is going to accelerate during the coming weeks. What he's done is threatened a crime against, how many people has he threatened to hurt, even to kill, with his proposed policies, which he's fanatically dedicated to? 
this guy is not going to be around for long. So the question is, what do we do? What we do, don't worry about just the diplomacy. That's important, but don't worry about it. What we do is we adhere to a commitment, as I suggested to my Chinese interlocutors yesterday, we, a commitment to a relationship among nation states as a people. We recognize that we have an interest in a good relationship with a people of another nation and several other nations. And therefore, we base ourselves on that commitment to good relations. Take, for example, abomination now. We call it an Obama nation. Take the case of the war in Afghanistan. This president is criminally insane about this situation in Afghanistan. There is no good reason for engaging U.S. troops in a war in Afghanistan. That is criminal. It's a repetition of every kind of crime that's been committed in the name of war in recent times by the United States. The general, is, general in charge is competently, is competently incompetent. That he's competent in doing what he does, but what he does shouldn't be done. Get him out of there and get the troops out of there. There is no reason why the United States should be engaged in warfare in Afghanistan. None. And any competent military officer of the United States knows that. Any competent diplomat of the United States knows that. But this crazy fanatic, this idiot, this president, wants to have this war and somebody talked him into it because the British wanted him to do it. He's a British puppet. He put his arms around this little silly queen. His wife would pinch the butt, I guess, this little silly little queen. <laughs> and he had the greatest genocidalist of the planet, Prince Philip, out there gawking around, and he's in the same atmosphere. You want to talk about a guy who is compar comparable to Adolf Hitler plus, here's this guy. World Wildlife Fund, he's an he's a example of what wildlife can really become. <laughs> and the president is cohabiting with this bunch of filth. Not a very good president. It was a big mistake. But after all, the British own him. They paid for him. They paid for his presidency. They organized his presidency. They funded it. They own him. We don't own him. We should give him back to them. <laughs> Tell him to get out of here. I, I, exactly where were you born, Mr. President? Well, are you Mr. President? I mean, considering where you might have been born, are you Mr. President? Some people are asking that question at some institutions. Hmm? Now, so the point is, we have to understand that our commitment lies not in relations between individuals. Our relationship is our human commitment to organizing this planet in a reasonable way. The question of the survival of civilization depends upon the relationship among four states who do not always agree with each other on many questions. These are the United States, Russia, China, and India. This is not to exclude other nations, but we need a powerful block of four nations, powerful enough to force the changes which must occur on this planet right now. And anybody who's intelligent in the United States or Russia or China or India is going to recognize that. But I find the tendency is to recognize that, the instinctive tendency. You want to talk to other people, sometimes you talk to them as diplomat to diplomat. That's all right. But more important is to talk to them as people to people, and particularly people in positions of influence. Can you say to them and look in the eye, we have a common interest which we have to protect, a com an interest in common which we must protect? Can you say that? Can you recognize that we depend for our future on that interest in common? Can we get nose to nose and negotiate not in terms of technicalities, but are we committed nose to nose to the common benefit of our nation for the sake of all humanity? If we can say that, we can correct our mistakes and adjust our policy. The question is often in diplomacy, as you know, the questioner. You have to get behind the diplomats and get beyond the diplomats or the diplomatic level. 
you have to sometimes get off in a room someplace and just discuss quietly. What do we think is the real interest of humanity? And how does that interest of humanity affect the way we should talk to each other and our people should think about each other? And then take that discussion back to the, to the place of, di of diplomacy and shape diplomacy by that understanding, not by technicalities. Are we committed to live with one another? Are we committed to promote a better planet? Can we respect one another in this kind of relationship? Nose to nose, person to person, someone devoted to their own country, talking to a person in another country, devoted to their own country. Can we somehow, by getting together, being knowledgeable people from our respective countries, can we say, what does our nation require of each other? And start from there. Then get back to diplomacy. Don't start from the technicalities of diplomacy in this detail and that detail. Go to the, right to the core of the matter. What is the future of humanity? What is our relationship in the future of humanity? What must it be? And start from there. And I'm confident that that's the only way to go. Whether it works or not is not within our power to predetermine. But that's the way we have to seek to go. And there's no other way we should seek to go than that.